welcome to episode three of Varan's Mind the Gap podcast, giving 110%. I'm Natasha Clark, an experienced business leader, chief people officer, and non-executive director. I'm joined today by Tom Holmes and Helen Till, the founding directors of Varan, who I've had the privilege of knowing as both friends and in a professional capacity since Varan was founded in 2012. It's such a delight to be here today. It's been an incredible 10 years for the business. Tom, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience, please? Yes. So I'm uh, Tom Holmes, founding director of uh, Varan Performance. I come from a finance background and did led loads of transformations for many years and then set up, along with Helen, Varan Performance um, now 10 years ago, I think almost to the day. So. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> And Helen? Hi Natasha, um, so I'm Helen Teal, um, business partner with Tom. Started off life as an HR consultant, or analyst actually, um, and working in France. Then very quickly got into the world of HR software um, and have since spent all my time uh, working with HR software, HR outsourcing, HR transformation, um, and in parallel to a very busy working life, have four boys at home, um, so um, it's a very demanding life and um, really excited to be part of the Varan story, um, but also very aware of what it means to be a working mother in this yeah. day and age. Well, I have to say, Helen, having observed your journey and, and seeing you outside of work as, as well, I think you've done an incredible job and mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I remember sitting with you on the sofa when the Varan baby was born actually um, and you were telling me then that this vision had been created with a colleague of yours Tom who hadn't met at the time and um, I must admit I thought if not ambitious you were certainly mad and um, when it comes to giving a hundred and a hundred percent um, I actually think you probably were at the place where you started to give 200%. So I really <laughs> did admire you when you, you launched onto me what was coming. Um, but it would be really lovely to hear that now, reflecting back to that point in time where Varan was born, you know, what was it that was identified as the gap in the market? Where did, where, where did the idea come from? Um, well, Tom and I worked together um, on a very large back office transformation. Mm -hmm which was at HMRC, where they were implementing SAP, HR and Finance. So I was working on the HR project. Tom, you were doing the finance project, mm -hmm. weren't you? Um, and I think even there, uh, we recognised the need for the business to come to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and that you know these journeys are never all about technology. They have to bring the business to the table. Um, and very shortly after doing that project, Tom and I started talking about you know, what would it mean for us to create our own company um, and bring that mindset to other companies looking to implement back office technology. I think then we also observed what was going on in the cloud market, SaaS market, and we saw that with the emergence of the new SaaS products, companies were being tempted by SaaS vendors into buying new technology, thinking that this was going to give them a silver bullet, this was going to um, resolve all of their business problems. And what we were seeing was because these projects moved so fast, because the SaaS vendors bring almost an out-of-the-box solution to the back office, yeah. um, they were able to move much faster than the old on-premise projects, which was great for businesses looking to make rapid change. Mm -hmm. But where it wasn't great was that they were not necessarily able to keep up with the technology part of the project. Because to implement mm. technology, it's never just about coding a piece of tech. It's about making decisions that represent the business. It's about bringing your data into those systems, making sure that everyone is ready to adopt those systems and change the way they work. So it's so much more than a technology project. And what Tom and I set out to do all those years ago was to, to close the gap. Right. And we talk a lot about mind the gap. Mm. What we mean is that the gap between what a, a SaaS vendor might sell an organization and what that organization wants to achieve from that investment in technology. And that is ultimately what we set out to do with Varan. And how did the vendors respond to that? I think at first they didn't necessarily understand the need for having a Varan mm. around, but I think the more we've worked with vendors over the year and the more they've seen the difference between projects where that support mm. is in place for an organization, compared to one where they mm. don't have that support and it's just led by the technology itself, 
I think they have they have actually learned the value of having um, a company like Varan supporting in what they're trying to do as well, which ultimately is to bring great technology mm. solutions to the back office. And I'm guessing the role you play as well is also a very non-emotional role. So you can be quite agnostic and quite pragmatic about the guidance that you're giving and the direction that you're, you're, you're facilitating between the two parties that are involved in the implementation piece. Indeed, indeed but most organisations, they're not looking for technology change alone, mm. uh, Natasha. They're looking for new ways of working. Mm. They're looking for greater efficiency yeah. and effectiveness, and they're looking for digital tools which really transform mm. the way their business works, as well as improving their user experience mm. and employee experience. Only a very small proportion of that is generated by the technology mm. out of the box. It's about changing the way the business works to get the best out of the technology. So when Helen talks about minding that gap, it's that gap between what the technology mm. would do if you get it straight out of the box and what you're actually investing yeah. in and what you're trying to achieve. And it's an essential layer to yeah. support clients in, in achieving that. Firstly, they've got to identify what it is which they really want as their outcomes from those kind of programs. And then we support them, as you say, technically, in breaking that down mm. into what is the people change? What is the manager change? What are the other changes you need to make in your business, as well as what should that technology yeah. look like to support that? And um, and for so so for our clients, what the what we've really done is help release the value of their investment, mm. and they are getting what they wanted from their program, as opposed to, you know, even in the cloud world, customers mm. we speak to who simply feel that they've changed technology yeah. and. Um, and that's a real problem, and I don't see that as changing over the last any of the last ten years. Yes. And actually, that gap, Tom, I think that gap, you see it um, during an implementation, mm. but you see it very much post implementation. So it's not just about getting a client to day one, making sure that they've got onto that platform successfully and got what they wanted from it. Actually, it's about teaching them how to keep making more of that platform. Mm. You know, with SaaS technology, you're getting updates and uh, new functionality from the vendors every three, four months. Um, and as an organization, you need to have a process and a governance in place that allows you to prioritize that, understand whether that's a value to your organization, how it's gonna impact your HR and finance service. Um, so that gap isn't just about today one, it's, it's beyond, it's that continuous improvement. Absolutely. When you listen to somebody like Larry Ellison, who's mm. the uh, owner and CEO of Oracle, what he talks about is the move to the cloud being the last upgrade, the last change to technology you're ever going to make. Well, our message has been from the start, you better make it a good one then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and I think you're right. I mean, I, certainly in my capacity as a business leader, I've often seen organisations implement thinking, we'll implement questions and answers solved in one go, move on, everything's fine. But what they don't realise is it requires continuous reassessment, continuous development of thinking and adaptation. And it's and, not a one day job, is indeed, it? Indeed, because Natasha, you've worked at companies yeah. where um, you know there's been significant investment mm. in some of the world class technology, and yet the levels of satisfaction have not been where you'd have expected them to be. Yeah, but it's all about the engagement, isn't yeah. it, of all parties involved in that process. And Tom, I was interested, I mean, we talked earlier about what's changed in the market mm -hmm. over the last 10 years. Um, and I was wondering now if you've seen any changes in what customers are demanding of you now well, versus it, back then. It is interesting because, you know, obviously Brian was born at the same point as cloud technology yeah. came in. So we've been there part of that journey from the start. And I've been reflecting on what has changed over the last um, 10 years. And I, I do think the technology has got better. We're now seeing the main top vendors of technology all producing solutions which are highly relevant and can work really well. Mm. Uh, but I don't think that that's really changed the amount of activity. In mm. fact, it's increased it. If you've got an out-of-box, out-of-the-box solution which works well, you need to change your business to work well with that out-of-the-box solution. So the quality's increased, but in taking that out-of-the-box solution, applying and making the choices and decisions you need to to get the best out of it, it's 
as big a task as ever. I mean, I think back, Natasha, when we were working with mm. you, um, we were looking at performance system, yeah. I, I, I remember. And, the, and of course, the technology underpinning it could deliver a, a performance review every day, every week, every month, or every year, or none at all. And that debate, and it supported all of those choices equally well, but that was a really big debate we had to have mm. in the business as to what was the most appropriate performance method for what was quite a complicated business. Yeah. And do you see that the expectation has changed now around getting a product, as you say, a vanilla product, and adapting your internal processes to work with that product versus what I was seeing years ago, which was people buying in tools and wanting to change them to work how their business worked. And yes. that must be a change you've seen. Absolutely. You know, the, the, the idea of changing the technology is mm. really mm. almost fallen away. It's very few people who um, are talking about that. But other trends have emerged. So one of the key trends I see now is producing global ways of working. Yeah. You know, organisations look at their businesses across all the countries they work in and they can't see across those different countries yeah. and leverage resources from one country to another country, etc. The only way to achieve that is to create global, yeah. globally consistent yeah. um, data, globally consistent um, grades, globally consistent organisations, so you can see what's going on in the different countries. I mean, there are still organisations, I mean, to, as an industry, to our shame, where they don't know how many people they employ, and they don't know how many types of people they employ. We need to move, as now, to a world in which all organisations of size have populations of people, their staff teams and extended teams, where they can mobilise and move those people globally or across their organisation in an efficient manner. And there's no other way of doing it other than having effective technology yes. globally. And I'm, that's, a, that's a whole new thing. People hardly talked about that Do you think ago. CEOs of today appreciate that? Because I think the world of, of HR, Helen, you must have seen this, but the world of HR as we call it, or you perhaps used to call it, I think even that's starting to adapt and change now, um, what was probably undervalued 10 years ago. And to your point, Tom, I see many companies I talk to now, it is about creating consistency, comparing apples with apples, having controls in place, processes in place that mean the CEO can sleep at night and has some sense of, of safety that his business or her business is being run with processes that are robust, can be applied effectively globally, mm -hmm. and as you say, where data can be then mm -hmm. accessed on a global basis. And, and I'm wondering if the value placed in what you do has changed now, and that if CEOs have a different perspective of, of really what you're putting in place and how that can change their business for them. I mean, most CEOs which I talk to know that they won't be CEOs in a short time unless they, they do can this. do that. Yeah. The digitalization of the front office has been critical to mm. businesses, and it's accelerating through Covid and other pressures recently. Mm. You know, the, 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 a good example would be uh, the competitors to Amazon. I mean, what competitors? Yeah. They, they've gone. So the speed by which organisations are defeated by their ability to deploy their resources effectively is, is lightning now. Mm. So not many CEOs are coming out of the Covid crisis without realising that this digitalisation this digital transformation of their business is their top priority yeah. or they are dead in the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the, the other things going on in the uh, market, we are seeing um, the uh, push on inflation and interest rates, which is making us even more starkly. So the drive for efficiency and effectiveness and a team who are working at their best potential is absolutely critical. In, you know, we're talking about inflation in people terms of double digit annually. Mm. With that, you're talking about 10 people, meaning 100 people yeah. in five years' time. And, and, and th these costs need to be taken seriously. It matters more than anything. Um, and I think that that and, you know, added to that, mm. the fact that COVID and stuff like that means every single organisation has to have all employees who can work remotely. They have to have secure records yeah. which they can share electronically, etc. means that I think it's actually top of the agenda of most organisations. 
Yeah. Then I look at the news, Natasha, and I'm not going to hand over to you in a second half. I look at the news this week, they're talking about P&O. Mm. I don't mm. even know if mm. they knew they were applying the correct employment rules or not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they knew how many people they had. Mm. And the guy admitted that he'd broken laws and then turned yeah. out he hadn't or he had. Mm. This is really shocking. Mm. And this relates to the UK's position as the lowest productivity growth organisation, uh, sorry, country in mm. the G7. Mm. We've got to address this both mm. for the health of our individual companies very quickly and to address the challenges in the market. And we've got to do it really quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not just individually as companies that this matters, but also as a duty to yes. our employees. Yeah and our ability to uh, remain competitive yeah. um, as, 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 you know, globally. Mm. So um, I, think it, I think it's really exciting, but mm. what if, you, if your original question was, is it more important now mm. than it was 10 years ago, I'd say it's mm. the most yes. crucial aspect for nearly every business yeah. leader I speak to. These days. Thank you, and it was great to read your article in ERP today, Tom, where I think you touched <laughs> on the interest rates and inflation, and you know, if anyone wants to read more about that, then I'm sure they can look at the article and, and Indeed, a little bit no more one, of your thoughts in there. <laughs> no one has really made a connection between these things yet, yeah. it's not widely held, but we are going to see this coming up time and time again. Yeah. It isn't just a pressure of cost cutting, it's a pressure of mm-hmm. the built-in increased costs we're seeing. In law firms at the moment, Natasha, we're seeing um, uh, cost increments of almost 50% a year to attract the right yes, new talent. talent yeah. And you can't even attract them with that kind of money. Yeah. So it's yeah, really it's tough interesting yeah. and tough. Yeah. So, so Helen, um, coming back to the, the project that you and I worked on, mm-hmm. which was early days of Varan. Uh, we were looking at how technology could support global cultural change and behavioural change. Yep. So one of the challenges I brought to you was how we could look to engage further the workforce, how we could mm. look to improve performance, um, and how that was predicated actually on, on changing the culture within the organisation. And I guess it might not be immediately obvious to everybody how technology can drive behavioural change. Mm-hmm. How would you describe the opportunity that it presents? Um, I think they have to work in perfect harmony. Yeah. Um, I think what was great about your project, Natasha, and your colleagues at the time mm. was that they were looking to be truly transformational. Mm. I think, you know, if you think about how we started that whole engagement together, we started with getting your colleagues together around a table, understanding some of the myths of that organisation and some of the things that as a, as a senior stakeholder group you were looking to address. Then we worked with your data and we used your data to validate whether those myths were true or false and that was just an incredible way to start off that transformation program because what it allowed you to do was to very clearly and in a focused way identify where technology Mm. could bring about the cultural shift, the performance shift and the behavioural shifts that you were looking to deliver. So I think um, whilst we may not have realised it at the time, you were an incredibly informed (laughs) client. (laughs) Um, And and it was just such a brilliant way to start that journey. And I think we used that sort of baseline to go out to market. We were very targeted about what the technology needed to do. Obviously at the time we selected performance and recruitment because they were the two areas where you were looking to make significant changes. We then implemented the technology, but at the same time, you were doing a huge amount of work behind the scenes Mm. with behavioural change. And I think, again, it was that balance of um, technology driving better processing, better access of data and reports. But in tandem, the team, the, the senior management team, were really coming from the top with some key messages and key behaviours that they were looking to embed organisation-wide. So that really was the perfect unity. Well, it's great. And actually, when I reflect back on that, Helen, I think what the project allowed us to do, it touched on some of the things, Tom, that you talked about earlier, bringing in the tools we brought in gave a consistent employee experience, which was part of the need 
within the organisation at the time this sense that I could work in one country and have a similar experience to working in another yeah. part of the organisation. Right, if it's consistent, you know what's going yeah. on. And that's the first yes. step. Well, and for employees, they feel secure and safe and yeah. it gives that psychological safety as much as anything. And then I think the other piece, Helen, that really came out, as you touched on a moment ago, was we could drive data out and it allowed us to make fact-based decisions. Mm. Mm. And as you were saying, we had quite a few myths that, that were in the business at the time which we were able to expel yeah. to allow leaders to challenge their thinking mm. and think in a more diverse way than perhaps they've thought before but using data to support decision making which mm. was really powerful yeah, yeah. and I still you. see that as a challenge in many uh, companies potentially mm. you know the, the ability to use HR and financial data and yeah. combine it and make it meaningful yeah. Is still a huge challenge in many organisations. Yeah, I'd agree. I think when you asked Tom what are the things we're seeing in the market, the thing, I mean, I work a lot in, in government, mm -hmm. and I think the thing I'm seeing which is really encouraging is the coming together of HR and finance functions. Yes. Um, and, and we talk a lot about the SaaS mindset and what is that SaaS mindset. And one of the key attributes of that for us is where you break down those functional silos that exist within an organisation and you use data to bring all, mm. the, all of those functional areas together. To, to deliver insights to the organisation. Yeah. And I definitely think that's something that government actually is doing really well. When they go to buy technology, you usually see government buying finance and HR together because mm -hmm. they recognise that you know, from a data perspective yes. and an insight perspective, the two come hand in hand. And that's where HR starts to become much more strategic mm -hmm. than transactional, which I think, again, is one of the shifts probably that's happened over the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's a critical... I mean, I do think it's very interesting because... Uh, I wonder sometimes whether the um, the analytics push has kind of advanced significantly. So that meaning is it because we're being, is it still hard because people are asking more complicated, more rapid, yeah. <clears throat> more important questions, or is it um, just that we haven't made enough move towards yeah. getting the data? And I actually think that the urgency, the speed, the demands of our um, of our boards and our leaders of businesses is actually much harder. They want to know yes. how many people are working where mm -hmm. today. They want to know how much those people cost and what are the choices around them so that they can move what are often armies of people mm -hmm. into the right position to face their markets in, 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 in markets which are changing on a daily and weekly basis. Yeah, and where I the mean, war for talent at the moment well, is generally indeed. so incredibly high. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Indeed, indeed. yeah. And, you know, the whole COVID crisis, to me, has accelerated each of these trends. It hasn't generated new trends, no. but it has accelerated ones which existed before. We've talked for years, Natasha, about working from home, yeah. all this kind of stuff. And I remember in your organisation, nobody worked from home. Yeah. As we walked into the office today, you were telling me that two, it's two mm. days a week, etc. And mm. that kind of trend, of which there are many, have been vastly accelerated by COVID. Yes. 14 years of progress in 14 months yeah. in, in that area and many others. I mean, it's a great validation for us. HR, finance and technology delivering it and the transformation related to it is front and centre mm -hmm. of so many businesses. And Helen and I have been banging on about that for 10 years. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great that, 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 that um, so many other people recognise it now. Good. So, so both Helen and Tom, I guess this is a question to the two of you. Over the years, you must have engaged with a number of HR directors, chief people officers, people like myself um, in the role I was in. Do you feel that the um, expertise in that role now it has had to evolve and change? And do you think the future role of HR directors will have evolved given now this need for technology to support and this demand to be... Um, more consistent, to more, mm -hmm. be more process-led, and to be more understanding around, and insightful, I guess, around the business. Well, I, I think it's really interesting. What we've seen in the last uh, 10 years is more and more HRDs, P chief people officers, in the news. Mm. We didn't used to see them very often. Now, I mentioned P&O Ferries yeah. the other day. Their HRD was on, P chief people officers on telly the other day. There are lots of others. We look at the 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 kind of service provider uh, issues which occurred uh, over the last ten years. That led to a lot of HR community conversations, etc. And during COVID, we've had consistent messages from HR 
leaders. What disappoints me though, Natasha, is how often these are bad news stories. Yeah. So it's when things don't go right mm. that the people dimension comes to the and, top. Mm. What we hear less of is how organisations have transformed themselves by changing the way their people work and creating environments which brings out the best of people. They tend, organisations like that tend to, um, tend to explain it through technology and this and that, etc. So I, in my view is we do hear more from HRDs. They are more important. It's just my sadness that we don't hear enough yeah. of the kind of really great stories of our colleagues and, and people we work with who are just doing an amazing job, really driving more and better organisations for their people. Well, hopefully customers. that will come out through your podcast series a bit more then and we can get those <laughs> great true. stories I'm out there, it. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Helen, if we reflect back I mean, over clearly what for you has been the most phenomenal 10 years, um, I've seen what's gone on in your home life and how that's transformed and changed. But what's transformed within Verano over the years? What have you had to work on and adapt to, to <laughs> continue to grow and get to where you've got to today? Um, great question. So I guess um, lots of things have changed and maybe some things haven't changed since yeah. the beginning. Um, I think what our clients need is still the same. Yeah. Um, so in that respect, I'd say it, you know, the, the fundamental need is still there um, and our raison d'etre probably mm. is the same. The things that have changed, I think if you talk about maybe some of the things that impact our clients, the obvious things are um, actually in response to many of our public sector clients, um, we took the plunge about three years ago of going, moving into finance as well as HR and that was a really significant move for us. Um, I think we were known in the market as being HR transforma an HR transformation boutique um, and moving into finance was, was a good move um, and it's been brilliant for I think our clients um, but also our colleagues. I mean we've got colleagues internally who actually switch between HR and finance um, and they really enjoy that variety. Um, so that, that's been a big change. Um, our methodology um, and again you know Tom talked about COVID and how that's affected many people in the market. COVID had a big impact on, on us internally. Um, it gave us the opportunity to reassess the way we were delivering programs. And I think our methodology um, is much more structured now. And I think the other thing that our methodology allows is it really talks to the business. Um, so we've really used the time that we've had and especially use the um, opportunity of working remotely and delivering programs remotely to think about it's almost that extra effort required to proactively bring the business to the table. Um, and as I said to you at the beginning, I think this is the key missing link in many technology projects. Um, and we have really thought about and adapted our methodology to make sure that business stakeholders not only understand what we're asking them to do, but are given the right amount of time and or not too much demands on their time mm. to be able to do that with us. Um, so I think they're, they're probably the two, the two big changes that we've made sort of externally and impacting the way we deliver programs. Internally, I guess what's been happening is we've grown up. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, 10 years ago it was Helen and Tom and, and, and you know, it's grown up now to the point where um, we have a different role in the business. You know, we have, um, you know, we have a leadership team and, um, you know, the company runs a, in a different way um, from the way it ran five and obviously ten years ago. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, that's really set us up for the next stage of our growth. And what I think is really nice to observe as well is that there are people whose faces I'm seeing now that were with you at the very start of that journey. And that says a lot about you as an employer um, and as an organisation that's clearly offered good careers to people and a nice environment to work in, which sure, is really important in, in when you're scaling and growing, isn't yeah. it? Well, one of the things I reflect on sometimes is why does Varan bring a different service yes. and, a, and, and, and a service which our customers value more? And, and it is related largely to the methodology as Helen's described etc but it's also related to the team and colleagues mm, which we work yes. with so right from the start we've been really careful to select people who are able and often have experience of both multiple cloud implementations but also have worked in industry in the role themselves in that bridging the gap exercise 
being able to understand intimately how clients and how customers work and how to, and what it feels like to work in a in a in a high pressurized business is critical for consulting skills yeah. and many of our teams and colleagues so the ones who've been here the longest have moved mm. from industry into consulting and back again sometimes as well and, and that's where the strength and the difference which Varan brings to those customers often comes from because you know what we're doing is not brain surgery yeah. nor is it an art but it is it does involve really understanding people what's driving them and supporting them to get the best and using the methods etc which you mm. described but you know too many of our um, of other um, technology implementations ones you know that other companies do whatever you you like uh, it's either an art or it's kind of like brain so it's so clever yeah. it can't be understood yeah. there's none of that in Varan this is pra highly practical toolkits instructions and people you can work with to deliver a real change for your business and I think again what I observed was your your team were able to put themselves in their client's shoes yes exactly. so they could understand that challenge and certainly Helen you did a great job with that when we worked together you 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 know, you walked in my shoes, you walked in the challenge the business had and helped drive solutions that were right for us rather than the ones that, that maybe seemed most obvious um, and, and perhaps would have been driven by the, the vendors themselves. It, you, you really helped to ensure that it met our business needs and I think that has to be a standout in the market and it has to be one of the reasons why you were successful. I mean the other again observation I have as a, a third party looking in um, is that you two are very complementary of each other so I think one of the reasons we complement um, each other or yeah. we're nice about it. <laughs> <laughs> <Both talk. laughs> Let's hope it's both. <laughs> <laughs> but you two are quite different actually and you both bring something different to the table both from a project perspective but I'm guessing as leaders of the business too and Helen what how do you, how have you seen your your combined strengths help take the business forward I completely agree with that um, and I think everyone in the team would yeah. say that we're chalk and cheese um, but we usually arrive at a pretty happy medium um, and I think that's just worked really well for the firm. Mm. Mm. And what would you say you're most proud of, Helen? Um, I suppose it has to be both. It has to be the balance, yeah. honestly, uh, the balance of work and home life. Mm. Um, you know, being, you know, building this firm with Tom has been incredible, um, challenging, taking up every waking minute mm. of my day. Um, and, you know, from my kids' perspective, it's amazing. I think that they're proud of, of, of Varan. They're proud that, you know, of what we've built. Um, and they've never once said that, you know, that they resent the time that I've spent on Varan. But, but that does mean that, you know, when, when it's Sunday and it's Sunday roast time, it's all about the Sunday roast. And it's not about, you know, you know there's, there's a, there's a work-life balance that's been really important. And I guess that's probably the thing I'm most proud of, the fact that I have been a mum. Um, and you should I've be. I've also been able to, you know, yeah. perform at work. And you're a great role model, I think, not only to your children's generation, but to people that work for you. And I'm sure to, to many people that you've worked with in your, your client base, I think you are an incredible role model and you should never question being proud about that because, you know, that, that's really necessary, I think. And I think it's also, again, from my point of view, one of the reasons I loved working with your company was your human beings, mm. you know, and, and working with people that bring a human element to what you do as a client was, was very much appreciated. Tom, I'm imagining you have a different answer to Helen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really proud of the growth of the team and how they've developed and their capabilities and skills. I mean, we, we started with kind of three people. We're now up to more than 90 people. That makes us the largest company working in our specific area in the UK. And um, that's incredibly exciting. It means that we're able to bring more difference to more people. But what I really uh, love is how much they enjoy working yeah. here and, and, and how fulfilling it is when we get everything right. And we don't every time, yeah. but when we do, it's really uh, exciting and, and uh, you know, it's a real thrill. 
still exciting after all these years. Very rewarding, I imagine, too. So as we come to the close today, I guess I've got one final question for both of you. Um, Ten years isn't where it ends, I assume. There's, There's more to be done. What are your thoughts, Tom, around the future of transformation? Where's it going? What's what's next in the world for, I mean, for you? Yeah, my, my view is that the pressures are going to grow rather than shrink. I think that we're in an irreversible route to digital transformation at the yeah. front office. Organisations who are not fully digitalised, and it's every organisation, logistic companies, everything else needs to be as digitalised as is feasible for their business. And this affects the back office too, because the speed in which businesses succeed or fail is going to get faster and faster. And delivering that, plus you know the other pressures we're talking about in the global situation, mm-hmm. in terms of costs, inflation, and all that stuff, is driving uh, a world in which we all need to really have a very strong grip of the resources we're using. And it's this kind of digital transformation, the kind of work we're doing, which is helping businesses you know, meet those, uh, meet those demands. So I, I imagine it's going to get stronger. I think software is going to get, continue to improve, but not in the leaps and bounds we've seen over the last few years, more as an incremental um, activity. And the difficulties of implementing it for your own business and for the requirements of one own, own business is going to be as difficult as ever because yeah. it's still you know a bag of uh, you know a box of tools rather than an out of the box solution for your business yeah i think that's right because if you think tom about the war on the war for talent if you think about um, interest rates and inflation if you think about risk gdpr you know yeah. if you, all of our clients are probably facing higher levels of accountability and more risk than they have ever had to face in the past. So the pressure on our clients, I think, is growing significantly. And therefore, our job is to make this stuff easier. Mm. And that has to be the next three years. Yeah, great. Well, thank you both. I mean, I I think just in summary, um, my takeaway from this is the world is not getting less complicated. Its its complexity remains. Um, Globalisation is just the way it it is now. Um, And the gap that we started to talk about at the start remains, as you just said, Helen, that gap's not going. It might slightly change in its shape and its format. But there's certainly a role for, for a business like Varan to continue on helping organisations, as you said, Tom, close that gap that is so critical and important to the performance of an organisation and to the enjoyment of, of the people that work for businesses and, and their ability to perform productively and, and to the best of their ability. So I wish Varan and its next 10 years all the very best of luck and I hope you'll invite me back in 10 years' time to, to check in with you again. <laughs> Absolutely. You, and over this year, we're going to be doing a series of events, series of parties. We'd like to invite you all to those events to join us because it's a very important year for us as a business and for our customers and friends and and and, um, and our colleagues and it'd be great to get as many people involved with that as is possible well we look forward to that Tom thank you thank you both thank you